Okay, guys, the very first question to you is going to be, what would you do here if you were the white pieces? Take as long as you need, pause the video, and uh, let me know in the comments before you move on. That's going to help me out to see what kind of player I have in our community. Now, the truth is that a lot of us, we get distracted with beautiful tactics and opening traps, and nobody studies these boring, quiet, dead positions. And guess what? We need to know how to deal with them because most of, I don't know about you, but most of my games, they are going to be like this, far from what we see on the tactics books and so on. So how can we try to at least uh, know what to look for when we get into a dead position? Well, the main thing, the main takeaway from this video, the only thing that I want you to remember is that we need to find something to attack. We need to find a target. And that thing is going to guide us through the entire middle game and even the end game. And I know typically we are talking about weak squares and weak pawns, but in a position like this, it's hard to claim that anyone has a specific weakness for someone to capitalize on. So I'm going to show you this game just for you to see it in action. And I hope <laughs> I hope that you at least give it a try. I'm almost certain that none of you found the right plan. And by the way, the next move that you're going to see is a move that has been played many times in positions like this. Very similar positions and top players they do the same thing. In this case, the target that we're going to be putting pressure on is going to be e5. I know it is not weak, but it's going to be our guidance through the whole middle game. So the next move here was actually pawn to b3 to put the bishop on b2 and put pressure on e5. This is going to keep my opponent paying attention to that pawn and it's going to give me again a plan. So just to show you how this game continued, and guys, you could look at the names of these players. These are extremely strong grab masters, and it is really tough to pull a win from a position like this against an elite player. But anyhow, after b3, we got bishop e6, just developing pieces, and then bishop b2. This is not just because he likes, <laughs> it's not because they like double fianchetto. This is more because they understand this concept of, of finding something to attack. So after bishop b2, we got knight d7, and now the knight goes to, to d2 simply because we want to continue to put pressure on that pawn. If I go to c3, it's hard to go from c3 to e5, but from d2, I can eventually go to c4. I could even go to f3. We never know. And that's why I was telling you that that objective, that target is going to tell you where, where to play. It's like it's asking you for the right moves every time. So after knight d2, we got knight d7. And now a very interesting, deep strategic move that I don't think it's that hard to find, but typically in these positions, we try to play mechanically and we do not stop to look at these little details. And the next move, guys, very nice move is actually bishop h3. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. First, this bishop is looking straight at a pawn, so it makes sense to trade it for this very good bishop. So for the white pieces, um, bad bishop, good bishop, right? This one has more scope, is put, putting pressure on something. For the black pieces, bad bishop, good bishop. So I want to trade my bad bishop for their good bishop. And guess what? If, if they don't take, I'm going to take them, leaving them with doubled isolated pawns. So of course, they took on h3. Now, automatically, not only did I get rid of my bad bishop, but this is helping me develop my knight. I know I'm going towards the edge, but it's better than on g1, and eventually from here, I could go to g5, I could go to f4, who knows. But the point is, I captured by developing one of my pieces. So that is three, then f6, and finally, we're going to connect the rooks. Guys, very nice to put the king in safety, but not too far from the center. This is looking more and more like an endgame, so I want my king to go in there. It was also interesting to do something like king e2, but this is just really nice that you also bring the rook to the open file. Now, immediately, the black pieces, very strong grandmaster, guys. I cannot stress that enough. Simply goes king e8, getting away from that threat. Right now, that pin is nothing, but in the future, it could be the beginning of a tactic. So we move out the way, trying to get probably to the king side. And then here, try to pause the video again. Pretend like this is your game in a tournament. What would you do next? You know that you are a little bit better and you have the initiative, but how do we capitalize? Well, the same thing. E5, I'm going to go ahead and put pressure on it. And now it's not only about the pawn. It's just that I really want to open up the, the file 
because it looks like they want to go king f7 to connect the rooks. So f4 was played, then knight to c6, and then this knight finally goes to c4. Remember, from the moment they did knight d2, and this was move number 9, and then 5 moves later, the knight goes to c4. And guys, this shows us that the white pieces are not doing all of these moves by accident. From early in the opening, they knew what they were looking for. So knight c4, and now we have knight to b6, and this is another point where any of us could get a nice position like this one and throw it away. So what would you do? Would you take, would you let them take you, or would you do something else? Well, if you take on b6, not only are you activating that rook, but all of a sudden you give him purpose, you give him something to put pressure on. So instead, and of course, if we stay there, they're going to get us double pawns, isolated, not what we want. So instead, the knight goes to e3, and now we're ready to go to a very nice square in the center, d5, right? So we got rook d8. Now knight goes to d5, and just like that, we improved our knight. So knight takes, pawn takes. This knight has to move, so it's nice to capture at the expense of the knight. So we win a tempo right there. And after knight e7, we simply go ahead and support that pawn. Guys, just like this, we're going from opening to middle game, getting really close to an end game. And no one can deny that we have the more active pieces. And remember the target? This is going to be the uh, decisive in this game. So after pawn to c4, we got pawn to c6. And now it's time to simply just capture only five. We leave that pawn isolated. And I know that I said it already, but from the beginning, we decided that was going to be our target. And look, move number 19, and we made it an isolated pawn. We know from now on how easy it is going to be to target that pawn. Now, after they took here, we get to this position. If you have not been pausing the video, simply because you don't want to, but this one, guys, really take your time because I'm pretty sure you're going to be able to guess the one of the top three moves in this position, but I really want it to make sense to you. There's one move that is good, the other one is better, and there's one that is absolutely the best move by far. If you thought of something like pawn to d6, I understand, and it does make sense to me. You're getting a pass pawn. You could even make it a protected pass pawn. If you thought of knight g5 trying to get to e6, it makes sense as well. But the most powerful move is actually <laughs> what, uh, what Gulko did in this position. The move was actually knight f4. And again, playing around with that target that we chose or that we picked on earlier on. Guys, the idea is that if you go to g5 trying to get to e6, they have this uncomfortable move. And of course, the knight is going to be in trouble. If we do it like this, knight f4, this is not going to be effective because we take and the knight is being defended, right? And of course, there's this other idea of doing d6 followed by c5. But even though it looks very powerful, and it is, it's not so clear how to continue afterwards because the black pieces could create like a blockade in front of that, of that pawn. So it was not so clear. And that's why they decided to just do knight f4 bringing the knight to e6 now of course we know they're going to capture but now the bishop captures on g7 rook has to move and after rook f6 guys they need to do rook f8 so we're going to get a free pawn that knight is pinned we're about to bring more pressure so of course they need to do this move now we take king takes and after this check we're going to get a free pawn forget about coming this way <laughs> And uh, of course, they went king f6, and then pawn takes pawn. Now, guess what? That pawn that we got for free is the same <laughs> is the same e pawn that we put pressure on at the beginning. It ended up on f4, and we're going to collect it at the end of the day. Now, from this moment on, this is a rook's endgames. We had a very powerful lesson on rook endgames, and that's why I'm not going to go too much into detail, but still, I want to show you all the way until the end to reinforce what we learned on lesson 123. So basically here... After pawn takes, should we take with the pawn or with the rook? Well, I want to leave them with only one rook, guys, so that it's harder for them to coordinate and defend. So rook takes, rook takes, pawn takes, and just like that, I got a pass pawn. Isolated, I know, but it's a pass pawn at the end of the day. So king f5, and here, pause the video again and see if you can come up with the most accurate move. Well, the move, hard to think of because I know that we don't want to let go of pieces. We don't want to sacrifice pawns especially in the end games. But one of the 10 rules that we talked about is we need to be aggressive. We need to be energetic. And that's why we're not going to miss the opportunity to go to the seventh rank. Hitting those pawns, and after h5, we take on b7. 
they take our pawn. And finally, when we take on a7, this is going to be two connected pass pawns. Guys, another rule that we talked about back then was that two connected pawns on the sixth rank could be more powerful than a rook. Now, before they took on a7, they wanted to make sure that this rook were uh, busy or <laughs> tied up to the defense of the pawn. So they went pawn to d6, then rook d8, and now they took on a7. I know, it looks a little bit weird, but basically the idea is that we don't want this rook to get active and get to the seventh rank or anything like that, right? So instead, we're doing d6, they have to worry about the pawn, now I take, and by the time they take the pawn, it's time to march my connected past pawns. So a4, no time to waste, then a5, the king comes over to help, and even though this pawn seems to be also getting to the end, guys, my pawn is there to slow them down, and always my rook could come from behind. Look, worst case scenario, I'm thinking one of my pawns, I mean, my pawn is going to be traded for one of their pawns, so they're left with only one. And if I have to sacrifice my rook for the final pawn, that's fine, because then I'm going to have the connected pass pawns along with my king, and that should be just too much for the rook to handle. So we have king four, you see, bringing the king over, then the rook goes from behind, and my king comes over to help. So just to show you how the game continued, h3, b5, this is just, the moment this pawn gets to the 6th rank, this is it. So at this point, we got check, king goes towards the pawns to help him out, and then after king c5, this is the end of the game, guys. So a7, b6 is going to happen. At this point, the black pieces resigned. Now, like I always tell you, feel free to take this position, set it up against the engine, and see if you can close it. So give it a try. Let me know in the comments if you did it, how it went. And before I let you go, guys, one more time, this game went from um, this quiet setup, which we're more than familiar with, right? The Fianchetto. From here, we could get into the King's Indian attack, the Vienna, the English, so many openings that we can transpose into. But they decided to play sort of like a modern defense, or if they do not have six, Pierce defense. But after e5, we take, at, they don't want to take with the bishop because then after knight f3, they have to move the bishop again. And here they're okay with the king staying in the center. And I know you might be like, okay, why did they accept this? Guys, you're going to learn as we continue through this course that many rules in chess are flexible, including this one. I know that I cannot castle anymore, but without the queens on the board, it is hard to say my king is in trouble. I could go king e7, I could go c6, king c7, I'm going to be just fine. I think you see this in openings like the Philly door and many elite players play it and, and it's, it's fine right but anyhow at that point i realized this is a dead quiet position i need to come up with a target for me to, to put pressure on and that was for the white pieces here it was e5 so b3 bishop b2 and then the whole game revolves around that e5 pawn so f4 putting pressure on on e5 eventually nice e4 putting pressure on e5 and then a few moves later you see how we take on e5, leaving it isolated, and we see knight f4 making fun of that e5 pawn. And then la lastly, after a few more moves, we finally collect that pawn that was on e5 and landed on f4. So guys, I hope that this makes sense. Like I said at the beginning, I want to repeat it one more time. The most important takeaway from this game is that if you are in a quiet dead position, look for a target for you to put pressure on. It doesn't have to be a weak square or a weak pawn. Just something for you to put your energy on and try to capitalize on it. With that said, don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in our next video.